And boom, we are live. Wait, are we live? My competitive spirit is to be the best at anything you can do. You know, if I'm in a McDonald's flipping hamburgers, I'm going to be the best goddamn hamburger flipper they got. But when I got a guy putting a ceiling on what I can't be or saying that I can't do something, well, that's when you fucked up because I'll prove your ass wrong every single time because uh, I ain't afraid of hard work and I'll outwork every motherfucker that there is to get where I want to go. Boom, and we are live. Let me see you in here, Manny. I am with Manny Rocha. We're at Strive Jiu Jitsu up, and Lodi, just hanging out. We're placing our uh, iPad on our Buddha here. <laughs> Let's see how it holds up. I'll try to move in closer to Manny. Sure. She doesn't uh, show up <laughs> So, boom, I want to talk to, uh, to Manny. Uh, tell you guys about Strive Jiu Jitsu, Strive Academy here in Lodi. If you ever stop by, uh, this guy is, uh, is awesome, one of a kind. Um, only chokes me out when I try to roll <laughs> with him. Uh, but I wanted to just talk to Manny. I want to learn a little more about Strive. Uh, first off, uh, Manny, tell me about Strive. So I, I met Manny at Smash. He had amazing classes, only classes uh, that I loved. I don't mean that really, but. We, uh, he had a great class in kickboxing and has a great background. Before I get into his timeline, so uh, you asked him out of San Jose for a little while, and then you kind of transitioned. Uh, and what made you come back here? This was originally home? or uh, No, not really. Lodi, Lodi is really new to me. Um, I was in Stockton for a while, for a long time. It's kind of where I started training jiu-jitsu and MMA. Um, uh, was in Stockton. That's mm -hmm. kind of where I started everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I made the move to Albuquerque for a bit. Yep, um, that and for then sure. back to San Jose. Um, I was actually raised in San Jose until I was about 15 years old or something like that. So, I mean, since I was a baby. You know, I, I never got old. to caught up with any of these. These are all little questions I want to ask them anyways because we weren't here. So, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm juice. So, San Jose yep. and then Stockton. So, raised in yeah, San Jose until I was like about 15 years old, then Stockton. Um, and then... Uh, Albuquerque, this one's more. Okay. You see it again? Is there a water? Okay. Sorry, wa there water difficulties. <laughs> but continue uh, on. But yeah, so I started off, uh, so I was raised in San Jose since I was four years old. I moved there from Providence, Rhode Island, which is where I was born. Um, my whole family's from Portugal. Uh, I was the only one born in America. So I lucked out. Huge yeah. population in San Jose, believe it or not. Yes. Huge yeah, yeah. community. Yep. So, uh, and I was raised in San Jose until I was about 15, like I said, then moved to Stockton for a bit with my family. Um, and that's where I started training MMA and Jiu-Jitsu and all that good stuff. Um, and then um, there was some times here and there where I went to San Jose for a very brief time and then back. And then I just decided. answered one of my questions. This is a random picture somebody uh, posted of you. And it was an old school uh, flea market style, like baby blue shirt, right? And the weird thing is, I grew up in the East. Uh -huh. we, we were ghetto within ghetto. My mom got me that exact same shirt. And only I needed it. No brand on it. Uh, you, you probably don't even remember. Some old school picture of you, like, uh, back in the day. Anyway, that was hilarious. And I was like, maybe he's probably not even from San Jose. Don't say flea, flea market. <laughs> it's not going to be the same the shirt. The Barry of flea market. It's not going to be the same shirt. And guess what? It was Barry of flea market. <laughs> that was, it was the same exact. Was I'm going to post going. that shirt after the talk. You'll know what I the hell um, I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, I was raised going to the Barry of flea market. My, I, I hated going kid. with my mom. She was the worst, I wouldn't say worst, she was the best negotiator yeah. where she would walk away from a pair of slippers <laughs> over like $2. Uh, it was embarrassing, but, yep. uh, but that translated into I her negotiation. I still go to the market to this day. It's yeah. like in my jeans. There's man. steals there, man. There's yeah. steals there, but uh, I'm always, I'm really bad at this. I cut people off and go on tangents. No, it's but, uh, but yeah, so you actually were from South Where did you go uh, elementary then? Uh, Lester Shields. It has a different name now. But I went to Lester Shields, then Pala Middle School, and then no! James Lake. Yeah. You went to Pala. Yeah. There Pala is no more Pala. No, well, it's gone. So I went, I, I went to Pala, sixth grade. Wow. And I don't think we, were, we even talked about this. Like Dr. Sanchez, when I was talking to the Olympian, mm -hmm. I recently had on. We were talking about that. I think Lester Shields, you probably would have went to. Actually, Lester Shields was on Gay Avenue, right in front of Pala. Yeah. Okay. I went to Lindell and I went to Palo. Yeah, Palo was just a little bit further up the street. So they changed the name of that, too. Yeah, Lester Shields, they changed the name. I don't know what it's called now. I, I can't remember. Palo's like some type of uh, academy, but, man, we were 
So we really, again, East Side products. I might yeah. as well call this the East Side show. Yeah, that, was the East Side show. <laughs> that means you would have went to Independence if you stuck around. Yeah, well, I went to James Lick my freshman Lick. year. Okay, that means you're on that side. Yeah, yeah. And, then, um, and then that's when we moved. That's when we moved back. I actually moved from there back to Rhode Island for about a year. My, I went with my mom. My, okay. mom. my mom grabbed me, and we pick up, we pick up and left. Um, and my brother and my sister stayed behind. And I have all my, basically all my family is in Rhode Island, you know, mm-hmm. from my mom's side. Um, so we picked up and left just for about a year and stuff. And I went to a school out there for a little bit. And then we ended up coming back, in, you know, not too long later. So, but yeah. I apologize for our Buddha, but I just want to show you guys real quick where I strive. I'll put some pictures up later, but amazing, amazing stuff. Rhode Island was when you went to New Mexico to Trent so, Jackson. No, no. So after give me, Rhode Island, give me we, the, the, the story. So after Rhode Island, we moved back to San Jose. Um, and uh, when I was in Rhode Island, I got I got kind of sick out there. I got I got pretty sick. Uh, my appendix ruptured and stuff out there yeah. when I was fifteen. Whoa. Um, uh, came like really close to dying actually. Like, do we, do we need really those? Bad. We need appendixes. I, I would think we need them. The yeah. doctors try to tell you don't need them, but that makes no sense <laughs> to me at all. Like it's not like a spare part, you know. Like we all know that there's no such thing as spare parts. Like, right. Anyways, yeah. so that happened, and then when I moved back to San Jose, um, uh, I was just kind of still in the healing process and all that good stuff. And then we were there for about another year or so, and then we moved to Tracy, and we were there for a little while, and then we moved to Stockton, and yeah. uh, so it was about probably I was probably about maybe 18 years old or something around 19 when I actually started training, um, in, in Stockton. So it's something like that. Same, same, same place here or, um, or when you, the first place you trained in Stockton. Same, first place that? I trained in Stockton was uh, with a guy named Phil Torres and he was the coach at the time along with Cesar Gracie and the guys for like Nick Diaz, Nate Diaz, and, you know, some of the other guys that were up and coming from the area. I, I, that time, I brought that up to Nick when I, I saw him in Vegas and he was the first thing he said was, Oh, isn't that Phil's spot? Yeah. Uh, so he was, he, he's obviously familiar with them. And yeah. I won't even tell you the story after that, what happened. <laughs> yeah. Nick, Nick just took me out to party. And like, yeah, yeah. I was like, no one's going to believe this. No yeah, that's believe. awesome. But, but if he comes across this, we're friends. He, uh, that, that would make him, him smile. So, yeah, so, for sure. So and it was cool because at that time, that. at that time, it was really Nick was the main guy. Nobody even knew about Nate yet, you know. And now Nate's the big superstar, which is great for him. You know, now that's awesome for him. I'm glad, I'm glad he's doing big things. Um, but at that time, it was Nick. You know, Nick was the man. And we were all, like, we're working hard and training very hard just to get the chance to spar and, and roll with Nick. That was our goal as the young up-and-comers in the we're gym. We're talking, you know? like, Pride Japan days. Exactly, yeah. yes. Like, during, yeah. like, the time when he was preparing for Gomi and all that stuff, you know? So, uh, well, Nate wasn't sitting still. Nate uh, had that, that video that I love, my favorite one, where he's got the blonde hair and uh, – some uh, oh some, some yeah. random some older dude probably yeah. twice his age yeah yeah like, challenged him like that was that was raw and yeah, yeah. I was like wow yeah you know? ten, so, again those those, ten, were, those were good times you know uh, and, and good then good. eventually as that passes on that's when you leave well first off uh, school when James Lake you know you had to move around so like that so you're back and you thought okay I mean uh, this is in Beverly Hills out out here right you're like I need some yeah. direction. Yeah, and then you walked into Caesar and Phil's. What what made you do that? What gave you the incl- inclination to do well, that? We forget that stuff sometimes. Was it a subtle little thing that your mom was like? Yeah, when I was in Tracy, your, your uncle. Or? When I was in Tracy, there was a Taekwondo place. Okay. Jiu-Jitsu wasn't even that big at yeah. the time. Like you couldn't just now. You can go to any city and find a Jiu-Jitsu academy. You know, back back at that time, it wasn't like that. You know, at that time, it was like Taekwondo was still very big, and uh, and that's what I got into. I was overweight, you know, I was like almost 300 pounds, and that's what my mom signed me up for. So um, there was a Taekwondo place there. It was called Moon Central Valley Taekwondo. It's no longer there. It was in Tracy, and that's where I started training when I was about 15 when I started in Taekwondo. Um, and uh, 15 or 16 when I started in Taekwondo, and I started really getting into Taekwondo, and uh, it was like Olympic-style Taekwondo. And uh, it was a lot of fun. helped me lose weight, and I always was just like, I was always into martial arts, you know, like a typical story. You watch like martial arts movies and Bruce Lee and all that great stuff. And it gets you into that. So the Taekwondo is what kind of started me on that path. It and is one of my favorite. There is no favorite. There is no dominant. You got to be like water. But in, in my opinion, um, I, I love ta- Taekwondo. Yeah. I don't know if you've watched. They've only done one event in Korea. But when they did do it in Korea, and yeah. you see those Koreans. In Korea is not a game. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> no, as far as being yeah. agile, like I've heard Rogan talk a lot about if you had to choose a body type or anything, 
it would actually be you and I would always vibe and talk about before class. It would be like a break dancer yeah. or a gymnast, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they just have that all around core thing. flexibility. And strength. I, I, I feel like Taekwondo just embodies that. It's so, yeah. but obviously, yeah. you know, if they're taking the ground, it's a whole other. Yeah. Whole other when, and when, when I when I got into so to kind of cut forward a little yeah. bit is when I started getting into MMA and I started sparring MMA and all that stuff. One thing I heard a lot was like. People were complimenting me on my distance and my timing, like being able to evade, like let, like making people miss by very little. That came and by, you think that came from the base. A hundred percent came from Taekwondo. One hundred percent. There's no question it came because Taekwondo is all about. I mean, obviously you throw punches here and there, but it's only to the chest in Taekwondo. They don't really at that time they didn't really score any significant points. Now the game has changed, and now it's becoming like a hit or pat game. I don't right. know. But. Um, back then it was like that, that, that plyo though too like, I feel like not everybody has that this is why he makes this jump rope for three damn minutes before yeah, every, yeah. everything that's so important yes, yeah, so being the, on your toes yeah being on your toes and the distance and time like the mobility understand how far away uh, to read your body your partner's body language and to understand how far, just how far away you need to be to have them miss just by a little bit so that way your counter can get there that much quicker and there's no question that all that stuff came from Taekwondo at least for me you know um, and that's helped me a lot you know, in, in terms of like uh, with my MMA training, all that stuff. Yeah, I feel like people who, who transfer too, if anybody else transfers like from basketball, if any, they got a lot to learn, but that would be the only advantage because they're used so much to that fly out and jumping. They're not as flat footed. Uh, yeah. what, what's the gentleman's uh, name? Uh, Wine Dude, Jackson's tall guy, just got Travis? knocked down. Travis. Yeah, he's Jackson's tra- name. Tra- well, he trains with the. Uh, Rousey, got it, coach. got it, got it. Yep, yep, yep. We won't even get into that. When he was at but, Jackson's, he was a monster, man. Right, but that's what I mean. I mean, the base of him being at Hawaii Pacific University, they're in a conference for basketball. He played basketball all the way throughout college. Yeah. And he actually started jumping in after that, which you would think would be very tough, but to be 6'9", like Matt Mitrion or whatever, uh, but still be that agile, yeah. is, is you don't find that anywhere, right? Yeah. And that obviously, the little things you do, like Taekwondo, if you did as a kid, it, it, it wasn't a waste of time. Right. Oh, no it all, way. It all, it all yeah, martial through. arts in general is a good investment, you know, especially yeah. for younger kids. It's, it's a great investment. You know, it's going to help kind of put them on a path. You know, being raised like for those first, you know, 15 years of my life on the east side of San Jose, I had some family members that didn't take the same path as me, you know, and that became an option for me at some point. Um, um, but uh, but the, but ta- joining Taekwondo and my mom putting me in Taekwondo um, 100% changed my life. I mean, it changed my life because if I hadn't started Taekwondo, I'd be in a far different believe that as well. Um, so, just to get you uh, back on track, your first step ever in Caesars Gracie's, why did it happen? So, yeah, so uh, my first, I, I never really trained like what with Caesar, you know, mm-hmm. Phil Torres was under Caesar Gracie at the time. So he's an instructor. Yeah. It's so, like John, shout out to John. Yeah. You know, be the next Phil. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, we're going to move past that. But, uh, <laughs> yes, so I forgot what I was saying. I know. I keep doing that. That's anyway, so it. yeah, so Phil was under Caesar, and I knew Phil because his daughter was a world class Taekwondo athlete, mm, and we know. all knew each other from the Taekwondo that scene. Class. Okay. Yeah, we all knew each other from the Taekwondo scene, even though he had his own school and I came from a different Taekwondo school. But in Taekwondo, it's very similar, kind of like jujitsu, where people you pretty much know everybody. And um, tournaments, all that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I knew Phil was a lot into MMA, and I knew he was training Nick and at least helping train those guys and stuff. And, uh, That's quite inspiring. Seeing them, like, holy shit. Yeah, exactly. So um, I had been telling him for for a while that I wanted to train MMA and stuff, and he, he finally told me like, if you're serious about it, then just come in. You know, come come in, and you can you can just train for free. Just come and train and train hard, and we'll train you to fight. You That's know? awesome. That's and awesome. Uh, so it was kind of like he opened his door, and then uh, you know I hit the ground running at that point. I just train every day, two three times a day, as much as I could. You know, I was just a young kid trying to trying to be good, trying to earn my spot to be able to spar with Nick and, and, and train with And that was so cool for, for Phil to do because, uh, you know, not everybody uh, these days can even afford martial arts, but they yeah. know that, okay, let him, let them, either he's going to fall in love or he's not. Yeah. But if he falls in love, obviously, uh, you know, that's the way you can, you can reward it. And there's tradition in BJ that a lot of people eventually, you have to not just learn, but you have to teach, right? Yeah. And uh, you feel that's pretty important because obviously one of the best ways to be able to learn information is to be able to regurgitate it to somebody else. Yes, right? that's huge. Uh, that is huge. And is that something that, that, that you know you plan to demand out of uh, um, people that come in to, to one, strive? You want 100%. 100%. Like, people ask me all the time. I actually got this question from my students the other day. You know, she, she came up and she said, you know, like, this, like, man, Mondo is really good. You 
know, our guy Molly, he's really good. I said, yeah, he's good. You know, he's doing, he's doing really good. He's one of the white belts, you know. And I'm like, he's doing really good. Um, and she's like, what's, I see him like beating him by tapping him by, yeah, like what, how come he's not a blue belt? And, and uh, to me, and I've told this to John too, um, the big thing for me is it's not about what you can do to everyone else mm -hmm. on the mat. It's what you can do for everyone else on the mat. So it's not, yeah, I want you to learn techniques. And I want you to be able to apply the submissions and apply the sweeps and, and finish the people, you know, mm -hmm. of course. But now I want you to be able to tell everyone else step by step how you did it. What can you contribute? What yes, you can because you like one of our guys, Mongo, he's, he's very good and he's very agile. Um, but it's just that. He's very agile, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's personal attributes that make him... 50 60 percent of how good he is comes from that his ability to be mobile and cartwheel past guard and all this other stuff all this stuff is fantastic there's nothing wrong with that stuff but you can't teach that to maybe someone who doesn't have the agility right. to j do a cartwheel past your guard right. or do a flying triangle or, or, or all this stuff is if, beautiful if you, if you did have to explain it to them you'd have to really think about it really visualize it yeah we, we do it on instinct right but when, you, when you're forced to teach somebody else, you have to break it what down. you don't realize is, yeah, you're breaking it down, you're dissecting it, right? You're going further away yeah. uh, like you would with, with any subject. you got to learn it so well that you can teach it to, yeah, to somebody exactly. else. Yeah, exactly. And it's like they say, too, like I've heard this before, something like, I mean, if you don't, if you can't break it down in detail to someone else, then you don't understand it. Right, right. You know? I something similar to that. If you can't explain the concept to a four-year-old or five-year-old or something yeah, like that, yeah. then you don't understand it well enough. That's why help, uh, That's why teaching kids helps so much. That's the other thing. That's yep. why teaching kids... Uh, uh, Which is another big thing classes. at Strive. You guys got kids' classes, yes. right? Yep. So we start at four years old. Four years old. That was going to be my next question. Where do you cap it? Like, you know, you can't have people in diapers right around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you feel the fours... Um, a good age. Yeah, so what we do is... Any, any mom that's listening out there. Like, yeah, so what we do is we start them at, at four years old, and we do a, a whole week, you know, two weeks for free, and just let them try it first. Give them a chance to really kind of get in the, the vibe of the class, because what ends up happening is a lot of parents, they come in, they're like, oh, my kid is reckless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kid is reckless, I can't, he's just wild, I can't control. I said, well, just let them try it. Because what ends up happening is that sometimes the kid acts that way to their parent or whatever because they under, they feel like maybe they can get away with certain things but when they come to a classroom setting and they see the other kids acting a certain way a couple of classes in they start to realize like oh wait i'm supposed to like sit like this right and yeah. i'm supposed to oh when coach says and you'll see when you're watching it from a distance they're constantly yeah they're you, think looking, we're so, yeah. you think we're so conscious yeah right they're always looking at the other kids and, and adjusting themselves accordingly so uh, a lot of times uh, i've been surprised numerous times on how well kids adapt to, to the situation in the classroom setting uh, when they're watching the other kids, you know. Uh, so what we do is we start them at four, like I said, and we usually go from four to about eight or nine, and then right around that area is where we break it to the next group. And usually uh, John, um, one of the purple belts, one of our purple belts, he'll be teaching the younger kids, and I'll take the older group, and we'll work on more advanced stuff. So it works out well that way. That's awesome. Yeah. I, and we only have to, to, to say the amount of positive things that happen. I mean, what else is that kid is going to do. He's going to be at home. What is he going to start watching Kim Kardashian at an early age? Like the amount of positive things um, that come from them being here, being surrounded by like-minded people is just, uh, the value in that must be insane, you know? I'm sure some parents are just like, yes, more daycare, but that's fine too. At, sure, least, yeah. at least you're daycaring it in a positive place. Yeah, the kids place, getting something positive from it. I mean, uh, and in terms of like even self-defense for children, if you want your child to learn something uh, uh, self-defense oriented, I mean, typically you don't want your kid, even if a kid is picking on him, you don't want your kid like punching the other kid right in the face, right? That's not, that's not a good thing. He's going to get in trouble in school. He's gonna, it's just not good, right? He's going to hurt the other kid. Someone's going to get hurt that way. But if the kid can develop some type of skill or understanding of like, oh, when the kid tries to hit me, if I can just duck down and grab his legs, take him down and understand how to control him, even without submissions, but just understand how to keep the kid on the ground and not let him up and call for a teacher while you're holding the kid down. That's, that's why, that's why I love you, Manny. Yeah, I wrote some questions down. I'm like, I'm not, are you kidding me? Every time I would run in to Manny, we would talk. We would talk for days because we just had so many things. Uh, yeah, I talk too much common. sometimes. No, I, but only if I like people. My <laughs> wife is laughing right now. My <laughs> wife is laughing right now because that's my biggest uh, weakness. Is I talk too damn much. I know yeah. my New Year's resolution was like listen then speak. So much easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but and I suck at it, and I cut people off all the time. But that doesn't lead me to my next question. Was I think one of my my favorite posts, favorite memes that you shared that stuck with me. Um, it was one of the Gracies. He's holding a surfboard and finished the blank. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember what Dixon it was? Gracie? Yes, but he says something about 
I can't. It was about control. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't, I can't I'm control, trying to. I can't control the ocean. It's yeah. something like I can't control the ocean, but I can learn to surf. Yes. And I can't control aggression, aggression. but I can learn jujitsu. I can learn jujitsu. Yep. And then what that really means is you're not you're not going to be able to control them, but you can control them as long as you, you can't control, control their, their anger. Yes. But you can control their physical body. And neutralize them. Yes. And let them scream. Let them do whatever they want. Right. And, and then typically, what ends up happening a lot of times, even when people. You know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've had some experience where people will be very aggressive, you know, and most of the time, I mean, 100% of the time and the few times that it's happened to me. I'm sure, when you're able people, to, I'm sure that happens a lot. Yes. But I mean, sometimes people go beyond just being like frustrated. Sometimes people try to fight, you know. Um, but even to that situation, when you're able to neutralize them uh, and, and let them know, like, this is only going to end one way and it's not going to end good, you know, like, let's calm down here, take a step back and let's think about like, right now we're just angry. We're just angry if we go here and we beat each other up. We're both going to get hurt for no reason, right? And this all comes from jiu-jitsu. I mean, my wife, Gabby, has been there before when it's happened, you know? And it's like you're just holding the person down, and you're like, you need to think about this because it's going to get bad. And right now we have the opportunity to think about what we're doing and understand that we're just acting out of anger and emotion. If we take Instead a second. Of how do I get out of this? Yeah, and not even just about how do I get out of it, but why did I even start this? And I'm talking about anger, like when people try to pick a fight with you, mm -hmm. you know? And jiu-jitsu gives you the opportunity to like speak with that person and and reason with them without having to hurt them. And 100% of the times that it's happened to me, which has been about three times, the person always calms uh, calms down 100%. I usually stand up and I help them up and they shake my hand. So it's, it's amazing the power that jiu-jitsu can give you yeah. um, and, and give other people even if they don't realize it's, it's helping them. Exactly. You know? That's the beautiful thing because what's happening there is is ego, right? And that's so and much, so it. much off the, the the mat there that it, it, what it does is essentially it, it, it humbles humbles people. Yeah. We all been tapped. We're all gonna be tapped. But to let the ego go and just tap, and I'm gonna learn from this kind of translates yeah. to life, right? In that way that not always gonna get things in your way. You can't just act crazy when something bad happens. It's better to calm yourself and learn. Okay, what's the next step? How do I get out of it? Yeah, right? I tell people that, that's what was going on in my brain when you were yeah. talking right there because I was so. So beautiful because I feel like that's that's the thesis. Besides control, in my opinion, BJJ is same thing with uh, wrestling. They said you know you can't have egos because you'll be humbled real quick. Somebody to wipe the floor with you, yeah, right. And yeah. and that's one of the biggest things that I took wrestling. But uh, definitely, in you know people come in, they got a chip in their shoulder, and that's okay to be confident. But their ego gets humbled in that way real quick, where it's it doesn't mean someone's better than you, but it's just respect for the other individual, right? Especially yeah. when anger. But if you don't have that. It's just constant anger, constant aggression. Yeah, aggression. and I think on what you just said right now, like coming, looking at it from a different perspective, like you said, like it's not necessarily that the person is better than you, yeah. but I would say that, I mean, there's no doubt that if you're new to something and someone is tapping you out, choking you, arm on you, they are better than you at jujitsu. Yeah. So taking that in and having the mental capability to say like, okay, this person is better than me at this. But instead of getting angry, you say like, hey, Get can better. you show me how to do that? Yeah. Man, I would like to do that. I would like to know how to do that. So that's you know? two, two different other people. It, yeah. One will say, that was awesome. Yeah. Show me again. Yeah. yeah. Right? The other person will say, you know, well, get you got lucky man. or he's too big. You or got something. lucky. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Got, show aggression or run out the door. That's I'm, the worst I'm, excuse in the world. I'm never coming it. back. I hate, yeah. I hate Manny. He's racist. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah. when they do come back, I feel like that's what's, what's so important. To get them from that person to the person that goes, you know, uh, hey, you know, you're better than me. If I go into real estate the way I am now, immediately I can, you know, think I know everything. But uh, I think the, the, the very top producers are so surprised because no one ever comes to them because they're yeah. all afraid of them. The first thing I do is I'm walking around bugging the hell yeah, yeah. out of that number one lady uh, and saying, listen, you're a top producer. You're the best. I, I want to learn from you, yeah. right? I, or I can think, you know, I'm going to be rookie of the year. I'm the best. Yeah, I don't yeah. need them. I'm going to prove it to them. Where does that come from? And I feel like that comes from, from sports for me, and that can definitely come from, from jiu-jitsu, right? So yeah, I'm just trying to see it in the way that, that like for any moms who are listening, there's just so much value, not just from jiu-jitsu, from sports, I think, uh, where we're both, you know, in the east side, people would say that it literally saved their life, right? Yeah, Gives them 100%. some type of direction because – of course, their parents love about them. Of course, their parents care, but they're working so hard to contribute that they can't always be there. At least they can put them in something that, you know. And that comes from great co coaches like yourself. 
have you had any bad experiences with parents? I'm sure there's parents that, uh, or usually, usually not. Have you had, when parents are watching other uh, people roll or something like that and they get angry? You know, we see that like the wrestling yeah. tournaments on that. Sure, yeah, yeah. You haven't had that at Strive, right? Yeah, no, not really. You know, our, our parents are our parents are pretty awesome, you know. That's great. Um, sometimes you That's get gonna, like. It might happen eventually. I mean, yeah, you yeah sometimes you get like a. Um, like the, the parents coaching or something from the sideline. Oh, do this, do that, you know. But it's, it's not coming from an ill place. They're just trying to motivate yeah, their yeah, kid, you know. Exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, we, you know, we're really fortunate here. It's like we're building slowly, and and uh, the group that we're building is awesome. You know, we don't have a, uh, we don't have any ne any negative energy. You know, it's uh, and I, I try to make that as clear as possible. You know, to everyone, and uh, I'm really thankful that we've we've kept that's that. I, that's why I love you, brother. <laughs> No, no, we've kept a great atmosphere, everything. you know. We've yep. kept a great, a great atmosphere, so I'm really thankful for it. You know? I was so happy uh, for Manny when I heard he was making that move because I knew what it was like for anybody like starting a business, right? Uh, nobody wants to take that jump. Nobody wants to take that leap. So in my head already, um, I was already so proud of him. And he didn't even know just the fact that he's taking the leap because nobody wants to do that. We want, you know, we're afraid. We're comfortable. We'd rather be comfortable and miserable yeah. than go for happiness and risk, yeah. and when you made that transition from San Jose to here, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy, and that's why even with Coach Sam right away, I was like, Manny, I want to come down here, let yeah. me help, all uh, right, and, and, and uh, I only helped like an hour, I didn't do anything special, yeah. I, I appreciate for that, you. but but just to come back here, and like, and I'll show you guys later, and see how far it's come along, and the great things, that's why uh, I wanted to share this with you guys, my wife, my wife's already come, see, uh, yeah. love it, Manny, my little brother is the junior, Black belt. It took us about. But I'm sure she means positive by that. Junior black belt means taekwondo. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. So taekwondo was big for her, and she always talks awesome. about. And there's a huge age difference. She's like 10 years older uh, than him, but she just saw the difference in him, um, and the change that it brought on him, and how close he and was to, to his sensei. Yeah, too, you know? yeah. He Conflict does. Conflict is huge, especially at a young age. He goes a lot of tournaments and so forth. So. Same thing, every time I, I see that, that mom that's doing that at an early age, I always try to, you know, I have an aunt in, in the UK that's doing the same. I always say, keep it going, keep it going, because uh, that leads me into another thing. Like they say, whatever trade it takes 10,000 hours mm -hmm. to mastery. Whatever you do, whether you're a carpenter, whether whatever, it takes 10,000 hours. And that, and that translates to 400 something days. But the problem is, especially with us, we're not patient, mm -hmm. we want everything fast. And as soon as people are approaching the 10,000 hours, as soon as they're so close to those 10,000 hours, what happens? They either give up, or believe it or not, the ones who love them the most, whether it's their mom, their dad, their girlfriend, their wife, might be in their ear to convince them that they shouldn't be doing this. Whatever it was. Yeah. If it's not jiu-jitsu, if it's whatever they want to truly do, sure. to follow in their passion. And what's going to happen? Then they change to that other thing. And then they continue on that thing, and before they get to the 10,000 hours, and we end up kind of going uh, uh, nowhere. But I, I feel that was important to mention. I even showed this professor who did data research and said, from the history of time, the 10,000 hours to mastery. But, but jiu-jitsu, you can spend your entire life. It leads me to my next question. What are your thoughts on timelines? And you, you brought it up already once. You care how much more your students contribute versus how they dominate, which is true because... If you're, the, if you're constantly the best one in the gym or on the basketball court, you better go to another open gym. Yeah. Or you better go somewhere else because you're not getting any better by yeah. being the best. You have to challenge yourself. Yeah, and that, that's that's huge. I think, you know, it's and it's uh, and the contributing thing. The reason I say that's so big for me like and my students is it's not contributing like, oh, like, contribute, like, do this for the gym or stuff like that. It's yeah, like values for yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, right? Like, Rudy would talk about this all the time. Bring value. The more value you bring, the more essential you are. To the place that you're at right mm -hmm. so and you bring value by helping other people right jiu-jitsu is about helping the people who have no idea what jiu-jitsu can bring to your life when they come in the door when you go to them and, hey how you doing you shake their hand you know you give them a hug you know it's nice to meet you my name is manny or my name is john or my name is gabby or my name is roman you know whatever and you didn't so you make them feel comfortable yes. that's the first step it Doing sounds it. like such a little thing but it's huge it's humongous yeah anytime mm -hmm. you walk into something new especially if it's foreign to you you're like, I'm uh, that guy, kind of I, gotta, I gotta break the awkwardness. Yeah. You know, why have it be the other way, right? Yeah, and uh, so, yeah, I think that's huge. And in terms of like, um, training with other people, that, that's humongous also. Kids teaching kids or teaching other kids. Yeah. damn, that's gotta have patience. 
yeah, yeah, I need to get yeah. in there. Teaching I need to teach kids, kids something because I, I have zero patience. Yeah, teaching, work working with kids will, will help you realize a lot. Um, Gabby uh, smiling in the background. She does daycare, uh, which she also offers for anybody who comes to Strive. Or if somebody, anybody in Stockton Lowe that just simply needs yeah. uh, daycare, you can hit us up here. We'll put you in touch with, yeah, with, work, with Gabby. Working with kids helps a lot for sure. And in terms of the, um, the development of jujitsu, like uh, for like the more advanced uh, practitioners, you know, like John, we got a couple guys, Mondo, and, and some of the ladies that are getting tougher. Yeah. So I'm always constantly inviting people here and always taking my guys other places. And a lot of times, and I send my my people other places too. Like people will say, oh, some instructors, some professors will say, like, oh, I don't want you to go like train with other people. I just want you to train here. Like to me, that doesn't make any sense. If I heard an instructor say that. I would get my kid out. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Uh, and if not so much with the little kids because the little kids don't even know that there's really other places, but like with adults, you know. I mean, I have people that, I, you know, that at some point I consider my acquaintances and friends. They train other places nearby, and I've invited them to come to open mats and stuff like that, and their instructor has told them, like, you can't go there. Like, I'm like, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know what I mean? It's like when I think. I, I don't even know who that is, but that was a display of ego. Yeah, and, it doesn't and matter. You want, and a martial and a coach teaching martial arts is displaying. Yeah, and that's and like an oxymoron. And, right? and I think, and I think, uh, who knows? You know, we all have our different perspective. This is just that's my where perspective. Business, yeah, that's where business but, mixes in. I think. But that yes, the that's money, the problem, right? The money but, kills see, everything. But the problem is, it's not just the money. It's it's the it's the uh, the mental state of that person, right? Like you said, it's the ego. Because like, if I invite people here, I don't ever charge anyone anything to come and train, like for open mat, just come and train. That's all I say, because we're all going to benefit from training with each other. Jiu-Jitsu is about constant development, right? Evolve. Of yourself. Yeah, evolving evolve, yourself, yeah. evolving your grappling game. How do you evolve with the same little group of people when you're not when you're not open-minded enough to expand your game and put yourself in the fire with other good people? You need different and, looks. Yeah, and I think there's too many instructors, maybe not too many, but there's a couple of instructors um, uh, that I've had experience with uh, that maybe they're they're good people and stuff like that personally, um, but I found that they're putting a cap on their students and a cap on themselves by not allowing their students to go and explore the places. Even like one day a week to go train and train with new people. You know, I think right. at that point those instructors are too focused on themselves right. and not focused on the betterment of their students. I you think know? that I think that's that's very thankfully that is a very rare trait you'll find in most great coaches, mm -hmm. right? To to actually do that. And, and what you said is so universal to. Uh, not just any sport, but you could take it to weightlifting or whatever. We got to try different things to get sore in different ways. It's the only yeah. way we're going to shock our muscles differently and evolve, right? If we're doing the same old traditional weights, we need those TRX bands sometimes. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy how those principles like translate to everything. But yeah, I would, um, and sometimes it happens with, you know, when you're young and this good looking, when you're the new person on the block, everybody's talking about you and going, uh, there that sometimes people react again it's, it goes back to ego in my opinion that they feel they're losing business or whatever but if i was him he could always walk over and know how awesome of a guy you are and say hey how can we incorporate things together how can we co brand uh, this and that and, and then it would, might completely change and his worries would be out the door right sure uh but he, he might be written that way and, and who who loses the students yeah right? the students that's and the worst the, the, the ironic thing the odd thing about it is that we're saying, like, who loses? The students. It's like, it's all about the students. Yes. <laughs> it's all about ego. the students. That's what's, what's strange to me. Right, right, it's right, like, right. of course, an academy has to make money to keep keep open, right? right and right. for the instructor to be able to make a living, to be able to teach classes. And, of course. But you're That's talking about when, yeah, when someone is being, when your students are being invited somewhere to go train, and that person is not asking for any money at all, and they're not saying, like, come and learn techniques from me. Just come and roll with everybody. It's an open map, you know? You can and tell, you can tell me who cap. this is offline. I'm going to walk in there and give him a big card. Oh, it doesn't big matter, card. you know? <laughs> I'm just going to give him a kiss. Yeah, I mean, he seems like a, a nice enough guy. I met, I met him before in person. He tried to be very nice to me. But right. to be honest, I don't I don't like when people ask for support when they don't give support. It doesn't right. work with me that way, you know? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. who knows? Whatever. Okay, and that goes back to give value. But let's, let's switch it to uh, your thoughts. Uh, I've heard different people talk about this. Uh, first, anybody who who's, knows nothing about... Uh, to, how does timeline work? I'm sure every person who promotes you is has their different perception, and you know some people are criticizing a lot, praise. I think as time moves on, what's going to happen is everyone's going to have misconceptions of what is the the right way according to the the holy grail, right? Of just like you line up seven people, you whisper something in their ear, the person at the very end will be a completely different story, Telephone, right? Yeah, and as times of religion, etc. Uh, from your opinion or your students, um, and you just I think it's been a year and a half now. You just got promoted to black belt, right? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, how long does it take for those stages in 
in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, it depends on how much they contribute. To reach black belt? Yep, yep. So, and for each stage, you would say, for example, from white to blue, like most people would start, yeah. you know? So, um, I would say that, I mean, I know I've experienced different timelines with different people. You know, sometimes if the person's a very active competitor, um, they'll be promoted on based on those those merits. You know, like mm -hmm. if they're doing very good in competition and they go as a white belt and, you know, maybe they've only been a white belt six months, but they're just like strangling everybody. They're winning everything, winning all the tournaments and all that stuff. And sometimes they're like, oh, man, you're ready for a blue belt, you know, and that's great. Fantastic. And they go blue belt, boom, boom. same thing, doing very good, or ready for a purple belt. And then purple belts usually were kind of like, where it kind of, um, I, I think that's where the, I mean, you have, that's probably where the two attributes conflict is time versus contribution and competition because some people think that, and I think with parents and since my wife brought that up, like, well, he's been, he, he's been a part of the program for a year and a half. Like, why isn't he promote, promoting? You're not promoting. Is it part of the program? So it's not exactly about how long you've been there. Would you agree? It's like we've brought up a few times, how much you contribute and give value. One of my other uh, questions actually was about tournaments. It was about competition. Some people might come to our classes, but they're afraid, so they don't want to compete, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, you would encourage competition uh, to that parent. I, I, um, to be honest with you, you it, test doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's. You know, it depends on the age group too. But I mean, some people just want to do it just to train jujitsu, like as as adults. You know, like. Sometimes they get like a little bit older, you know, something like that. They just want to train something to help them keep them in shape, learn some self-defense, um, and learn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because it's such a popular art now. It's becoming such a popular art, um, and I have a few students like that. And that, I that's cool. And I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't push them at all to compete. I tell people all the time. It's funny because people who know me from the past, they know me as like, oh, an MMA guy or you know, a competitor. And it's like I tell people all the time, like, if uh, here's a tournament coming up, if whoever wants to do it, let me know. If you don't want to do it, doesn't really matter. To me. You know, I'm not here to tell you right. that you should what you should do. You know, right, right. I'm just I'm just here to help guide you on your journey. And, and the main important thing to me is that the person stays with jujitsu. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because jujitsu will genuinely make your life better. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just helps in life. You know, it's we could sit here all day and talk about all the benefits in terms of detail, like what exactly helps in life. Mm -hmm. But it helps you in so many different aspects of your life. It's amazing. Right. So the competition thing is not huge to me. I like to compete, but only because. Now I'm a black belt, and I feel like I need, I need yeah I need to keep testing myself, and with all the, the the best black belts in my area, so I try to train with as many black belts as I can, as many tough guys as I can. You know like, what else is when you set that date, it gives you a reason. Absolutely. The hardest thing for me to adapt to when I got out of college was everything I did, every time I lifted, it was always for season starts at X. So I'm decking out this. So it, the weirdest thing is when it was all done, I was like, wait. Am I going to the gym again? Like for myself, yeah. right? Like just to get better. As weird as that sounds, that was tough because it was always something like, I want to be freshman of the year. I want to be MVP. Sure, yeah. And then that would really drive me. So it's weird as it sounds that uh, I kind of ha had kind of a, not an identity crisis, but a weird way. I was like, what is my motivation now? So I could see the fact that when you set tournaments, when you set those, you're essentially setting goals. Yeah, because absolutely. If you don't have a goal, then you're just, you're just going to jiu -jitsu. You know yeah. what I mean? But if you put that pressure on yourself, like, no, I got to get ready for this fight. Yeah, Shit's coming and, I, up. and I think that that definitely plays a part. But I think people's goals are different, right? Like for a person who doesn't want to compete, their goal could be like, I want to get my blue belt. Mm -hmm. or I want to so lose weight. Just, yeah, just, or I want to lose weight, exactly. Or I want to do both. Mm -hmm. So they come to Jiu-Jitsu with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I lost, you know, three pounds this week. You know, I'm feeling great. You know, you, you everybody, in class, everybody in class is giving me tips on how to eat better and all this different stuff. And now you're getting that healthier lifestyle that you were looking for that that was part of your goal, you know? You're very. You're getting closer and closer to your blue belt every time you come to class. You know, every time you're learning new techniques, every time you're drilling. You know, every time you're on the mats, you're getting closer to those goals. To me, it doesn't always have to be about competition. If you ask me my personal opinion on if I think competition is beneficial, I would say yes, I think it is. But I'm not gonna tell you like you need to compete. I don't do that. It's like if you don't want to compete, I'm not gonna force you to compete. You know, you know what it is? I think it is it's change. Anytime in our life when anything is going the way it's going. Um, just gotta change them. Whether that means coming in to strive for the first time, which led to the healthy food advice, sure, all those absolutely. things. Uh, but we're creatures of habit, right? So even if you don't go to jiu-jitsu, but if you want to change the way things are going on in your life, something's gotta change. Right? Mm -hmm. Something's gotta adapt, something's gotta evolve. So we keep you keep having that, right? By going to tournaments. Yeah. If, if you had to pick one attribute for strive, some kid who's at strive but listening, he wants to get promoted and suck up to Manny 
uh, what's one thing he can do? I think we kind of talked about contribute to others. That would, that would be the, what, what would really hit the button for you that are right, you just went on the meter of getting yeah, promoted. Yeah, it's 100% giving value. Giving to back to the people on the mat. It's that, that Trump's time, that Trump's competition. It, by far. Okay. I mean, the time thing is huge for me. Mm. The time thing is huge for me. That's consistency. Like, and I, you see some people, yes, it shows consistency and it shows that you're not just going like for a shortcut, like trying to suck up and do all these different things to try to, no, that doesn't, you know, for me it's kind of like whatever, that's yeah. cool yep, to yep. help or whatever. But I'm a big uh, advocate of time on the mat, you know. And I, you see some guys now, which is great, and they're very tough guys in competition. They win a lot of tournaments in five years or whatever. They're black belt. It, to me, is like that's crazy. That's fine, you yeah. know. Hey, I, who am I to say anything? The people who promoted them are very good, and right. I can. But in, for me, I will never promote somebody to black belt in five years. It will right. never happen. So right. if you're looking for a black belt in five years, don't come to me. Rakesh it, just joined. Uh, Rakesh, what up, Rakesh? Uh, yeah, no, that's... I to mean, me, it's... it's a, sorry, I mean, like... To no, me, that was it's, awesome. It's about, like, it's, uh, it's about time on the map. You know, yeah. you got to put the time in. There's no question. Because, like I said before, it's not about... You can go to competition and be a killer and be beating everyone. And, and oh, and that's fantastic. You show up to the gym, you train hard, you leave, come back every day, two, three times a day. But what did you do for the people that maybe look up to you? Mm -hmm. Or what did you do for the younger the younger generation every day? And not what did you do once, what do you do on a daily basis see, to I help them? I feel and see that side. And I remember uh, my wife mentioned to me uh, that, this was Ta Taekwondo obviously, that he's so and so belt. Obviously, dad has a good heart, he wants to help. And he's saying, oh, I need to talk to the, the, the coach. Mm -hmm. So and so got promoted, why didn't my son get promoted? And when she's venting to me, uh, I immediately flip because obviously there's perspective, right? I put myself in your shoes and I think, hold on, hold on. You need to explain this side. And I said the, the whole thing that, you know, it is his sense, his own pride that it would be beneficial to him if he even made him work a little longer, a little harder to get his belt. No one's taking anything away from him in that way. And it's also his sensei's reputation that if he just hands out black belts to everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that even if that kid didn't, quote unquote, earn it, it's not necessarily a good thing, not for himself, but for that kid, right? So I try to obviously uh, give her perspective from that side, not the parents' perspective yeah. of that. Uh, but, but obviously, you know, he just lo loves his kid. He doesn't know what's going on. Sure. The kid comes and says something to him at a young age, like, so-and-so got a green belt. Why don't I get a green Instead of, you know, dad's going to feel like he has to react, do something. But really what he should be telling you, uh, telling him is, no, just work harder, right? Yeah. Continue and on. That happens and this my, is life, right? And that happens in my kids' classes. You know, I have these little kids, you're talking about four and five years old. Yep. And they'll see the other kids getting stripes on their belts. They'll get a stripe. And they'll come to me like, Coach, like, I didn't get I a stripe. Run. Like, how come <laughs> I didn't get a stripe? Yep. And I don't say like, oh, well, here, I'll give you a stripe too. No, it's like I explain to them. Take that's the time. A, sit down with them trophy. And let them know, you know, like, hey, the reason these three got a stripe is they've been here a little bit longer than you. They've yeah. been here a few months longer. Yeah. They've been trained. They know some techniques that you don't know, that you don't learn, that you haven't yeah. learned yet. But don't worry. You're going to learn them. And then your day's going to come soon. You'll get your stripe once you learn those things and you put the time in like they have. Oh, okay, coach. You know, and they understand. It's the, the thing is, I think a lot of times we're looking for a short way to fix the problem. So it's like, oh, how come my kid didn't get this? Like, Let me give you $200 and you give him a green belt. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. Not in jiu-jitsu, at least not here. It doesn't yeah, work that maybe way. Maybe in politics. But I, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like, every, we all have it's to crazy really follow the same protocol to get to earn our, our accolades, right? To earn our belts or whatever. These, these principles all translate to life. I was talking about my mom was so tough on me that I would come home and be like, I got cut for sixth grade basketball. My mom, I got cut. This is bullshit. You know, he's, uh, the coach just doesn't like me. Yeah. Right? Not that, I'd be honest with myself, that I suck. I didn't prepare. I'm not ready. Yeah, it couldn't have been, couldn't uh, have been us. Couldn't have yeah, been yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's, how many of those you, you have walking here? Probably hundreds. Yeah. And I loved in the moment that my mom would never be that mama lion that would do what? Somebody messing with my baby, yeah, right? Yeah. He's going to go out. I'm going to go talk to that coach. And that's the hardest thing for coaches. And she would literally like keep washing the dishes and be like, no, it's probably you. I don't care. Go figure <laughs> it out. Yeah. Go deal with it. And at the time, I like go back, right? Kicking and screaming. Right? Like, no, this is bullshit. Go ask the coach what you need to do to get yeah, back go on the team. Coach. But looking back, I'm so glad that she did that because the other moms, they think that they're being good moms by doing this, but they're actually being bad yeah, moms by not letting instinct. them work it out. Yeah, right? they're going based on defensive instinct, very similar to, like, anger. Right? So that's, that's what I think about, like, back with, with life. And then we have situations that don't work out in our favor. We've got two options, right? We can, you have the person next to you who's going to 
complain, who's going to bull, because tell you the story of, yeah. I could have done that, but the blah, blah, blah was the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And Mar Roman's problem is I have no fucking filter. Oh, yeah. So, I, so, yeah, I know, but then when you're around your in-laws and stuff, so yeah. I get yelled at. But, <laughs> but really, I, I, you know, I asked the real question that we all don't want to ask ourselves that, okay, you know, check out, life's, life's not, not fair, how are you going to respond, right? Yeah. You can get angry, you can blame others and have that story for the rest of your life, how if you you, you didn't do it because somebody else, or you can put it to yourself. And, yeah, uh, exactly. And that goes for respond. like you just said, like you just said, it goes for everything in life. Right. You know, it's like it's, that's why I always talk about how jujitsu. That's why it's not about jujitsu. It's about life. Yeah, yeah it's about beautiful, life. Beautiful. Jujitsu teaches you life lessons. Exactly. You know, it's exactly. it's not about like if you're uncomfortable somewhere or you're not reaching the level of success you want to reach somewhere. It's your fault. It's not anybody else's fault. Oh, this person didn't promote me. Then what did you not do to not get the promotion? Ask yourself. I mean, yeah, because it, yeah. it's like we're we're in control of how much we output, right? Like if I wanna if I wanna expand my academy, what do I need to do to expand my academy? Like I have a space in the bag, okay, what do I need to do? Okay, well, you know what I need to get to work. I need to open this wall up, I need to get the mats in here, I need to clean this up. I need to, it can't be like, oh well, I'm doing I haven't done it yet because of whatever. You know, nobody's helping me. Or what the landlord, whatever you can make up a million excuses of what why you're not achieving the next level of success that you're trying to achieve, you know. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're just remind yourself that as long you're as you're telling yourself and yeah, you're asking yourself like, uh, or you're telling yourself like, oh, it's this person or it's this group why I can't achieve this type this level of success. Everything outside of myself. Then as soon as you catch yourself in a moment like that, you need to like tell yourself like, whoa, like it's me. Like it's me. When you start convincing yourself that it's other people, that's a blatant sign that it's you that needs to make the adjustments. And that's not a bad thing because we go through all throughout life on a regular basis yeah. going through shit every day where you're like, uh, no, 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 wait, that's me. That's my fault, you know? Why did my engine blow up on my truck? Because well, I should have got the damn oil changed. You know what I mean? And, and, and this, this sounds like a negative you know? conversation, but many of the two most positive people you will ever meet. And it's crazy because the reason I think the most positive people you'll ever meet is because we understand those things that if someone jumped in just sounded out because yeah. we're used to those negative yeah. voices. Like yeah, you, and, you and have somebody next to you and they're just the whole time talking about somebody else or complaining about somebody else. What really goes on in my head is what are they saying when I when I'm gone, when I walk yeah. away. Yeah, right? yeah. And and the thing is, realistically nobody wants to be around. So they'll just you know they don't say it politely, they'll just drift away sure. from that person. And you're thinking this whole time, well, what's wrong yeah. uh, with me, right? It's this, it's this vicious. And with this, I'm not. And like, like Rome just said, and you can't I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. Jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not trying to sound negative at all. No, no, I mean, no, anybody who knows no, me no. knows I'm. I, I I stay as far away from negativity as possible. Insanely possible. What I don't. What I don't shy away from is the truth. Yes. You know. So it's like if you if you have if you have an issue, you're having a problem. You need to be able to confront that and figure out how you yourself can fix it. Because at the end of the day, you hear this a million times, and I'm going to say it again. At the end of the day, it's on you. Everything you're trying to accomplish, the level of success you're trying to accomplish, if you want to you know, have nice things for your wife and have nice things for your family, those things, you have to figure out ways to make those achievements and accomplish those things. Mm -hmm. And the, and like it, it's you and I talking right now, right? Like, Are you happy with what you're doing right now? Absolutely. You're excited, right? I'm super. Okay. And, and the fire in your belly, believe it or not, you're three times more motivated as you would ever imagine, with yeah. work ethic-wise. And it's not just about success, right? Like yeah. before you ever, whatever you started doing now, you were still doing fine, right? right. Doing good, right? right? Uh, same here. you're depending on it. Uh, right? versus yourself exactly putting so, on your shoulders so that's what I'm saying it was the same thing with me you know it's like not it's not the situation I was in was bad you know right. things were great and everything's good but right. this if you if you come to a point where you're like okay I'm here and I'm doing okay yeah. and I can stay here but you know it's what it's comfortable yes no risk. but you know what I want to see what else I can achieve I want to see I, I feel like I can make something big like right. for myself I right. feel like I can do something greater in my life right. and that's what I want to do and nothing wrong with what you were doing before. Mm -hmm. Just sometimes you want you expect more out of yourself, and, and then your and that's, brain. That's not going to come heart. with a risk, but risk is just one thing. The amount that I think that you'll grow as a person, the fire in your belly that you never imagined that you actually love what you're doing, right? Yeah. When it's your own, it's your shoulders. Was something that um, I couldn't even uh, fathom, right? And I'm, yeah. I'm sure when you get wake up in the morning, you open these doors, and you're like, man, this is my purpose, right? Yeah. I finally have a purpose, and I think that's what most people. Even listening, uh, what up, Alyssa? Alyssa's joined. Um, are searching for, it. yeah, uh, like in life in that way. So such a such a beautiful thing. And well, aside from jujitsu, you guys offer boxing, offer wrestling, yes, offer uh, Muay Thai. I thought I thought out of all 
the instructors I have. Not, my not favorite really, class is Muay Thai. Oh, sorry. So, go ahead. so um, I don't, I don't teach, I don't teach Muay Thai. Really? I, I got, yeah. I teach my kickboxing. Class, man. I teach kickboxing. Oh, kickboxing. Right? So got it, got it, got it. it's different because it my instructor was Mike Winklejohn, right? American was, kickboxing versus Muay Thai traditional. Yeah, style. he he fought both. He fought mm -hmm. Muay Thai uh, overseas, and he and he was a world champion in Muay Thai and American kickboxing. Um, but I don't tell people I teach Muay Thai because I never studied traditional Muay Thai. So I don't feel like it's right for me to say like I teach Muay Thai because I don't. Respect I that. teach striking. You know, I teach kickboxing. I teach the things that I've been able to have success with. Those are the things I teach. I, I don't like people ask me about Muay Thai, um, uh, but I, I don't but teach there's, Muay Thai. There's, like, there's, yeah, there's like, a group, like Coach Rudy at uh, yes. yes, Mass Gym. Yes, he yes. teaches Muay Thai because okay. he's a world-class Muay Thai fighter. Got right? it. Not me. I'm just a striker. I try to do my best to, to try to share the knowledge that I have with the skills that I've developed over the years. And so, if you're not sure where that variance was... Uh, gosh, I'm forgetting his name. A Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, trainer, American uh, kind of a traditional American kickboxing uh, coach. The Javier no coaches Mendes? Taekwondo guy. Uh, uh, coaches uh, Duke Rufus. Oh, Duke, Duke, Duke Rufus. Rufus yeah. And you look up a, video, uh, a YouTube with Duke Rufus. Yeah, the brother. jiu jitsu instructor there, uh, uh, Daniel Vandley. He's part of the Carlson Gracie team too. Four, four to be black belt over there. He's awesome. Th there, there's a fight with Duke Rufus, and his brother fights somebody from Thailand. Epic, the late kicks. fight, yeah, yeah, but but that just shows. But at, Rufus, right? but, at, but at that time, it was American U, USA kickboxing, kickboxing versus Muay traditional. Thai. And obviously, I, I saw the difference when, when I went to Thailand. The teeps, the way the teeps were kind of, they were telling me to do stuff that, in my mind, I was like, oh, Manny Hui was way better, right? I'm not using, but they're just following traditional. Sure. No, no disrespect to them, they're just following traditional all. principles. And there's things you can take there, take from that, to your own version of whatever yeah, you're going to use. Every, and uh, I think mean, that's the, the beauty. Yeah, know, a lot of times uh, people, like, arts. I think it's important for, like you said right there, like, there's nothing wrong with the way they showed her or the way I showed her. I think it's 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 about taking in, trying all these different ways that people have shown to you and figure out which way works best for you. You right. know, figure out which way is most beneficial. It doesn't mean that this one is better than that one. It just means that maybe a, a certain way might work better for your body style, uh, your distance, all that type of thing. You know? Right. Um, I'm going to say that for the last... Uh, Question. Uh, oh, real quick on a lot of people know the side of uh, New Mexico um, uh, with you when you spent some, some time there. Um, in fact, like Mike Winklejohn had with you, uh, I never even got to ask this question. We talked about it a lot, but uh, what led you there to make Winklejohn even discover you and invite you down? Because it's, it's kind of an invite only thing, right? Yeah, uh, um, it, I actually made friends with somebody out there named Heather, Heather Clark. She, she's a fight in the UFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I made friends with her um, online, and she's like, oh, you you know, you train, you should come down and train. Because I told her I was looking for a place to train seriously, but it was hard to find a place in San Jose where I was at because I didn't really have money at the time. Yeah. It, you know, it was, it was difficult. So we were having these conversations back and forth, and she said, you know what, why don't you come out here and try it out and see what you think. So she invited me out there. Um, I was like, okay, let's do it. I wasn't doing anything at the time. I was just sitting there, you know, at home and figuring out what I needed to do. So I drove out there. Um, and uh, stayed there for a couple of days, uh, a few days trained right away, and 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 everybody right away was real who, nice to me in terms of the coaching. Who, who asked first, if you don't mind me asking, because the reason I say sometimes in life, people are afraid to ask. Yeah. You've got to ask, right? Because you don't want to feel like a sellout, like you're you know, you're know asking something from somebody, but there's going to be times in life that you've got to simply lower the ego, ask, and you never know where that's going to lead you, right? Yeah. So they had their discussion, hey, you should come here, but you're all... <laughs> yes. Great. I think... I can't remember you the exact don't, conversation don't be afraid so a long time ago. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure that I was probably like, oh, you know, like maybe I can come out there. And she was like, yeah, you should, probably something like John that. John just you know? jumped out. What up, John? <laughs> Are you the one hitting the hearts over yeah. and over? Take it easy. No, I'm just kidding. We love you, John. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I think it's like, I mean, I have to, uh, who knows, you know, but it was like a mutual thing because I know I really wanted to, I mean, it was Jackson's, yep. you know, Jackson Williams. It's like one of the biggest, if not the most successful MMA team in the, in the history of MMA right, right now, you know. Right. So talk about iron sharp and iron. Yes, exactly. Get in there. Yeah, yeah, we can get into those getting better. Yeah, and a lot of times okay. getting your ass kicked means getting better. Yes, because you have no choice. Life. It's either you life get, transition. Yeah, either you get better or you run away. Right. Exactly like life. Right. right? Either yeah. you you find a way. You ask the right people. How do I develop my skills so I can thrive in this environment? Or you tuck your leg between your tail between your legs and you take off running and look for an easier path, which is what a lot of us do in life sometimes. Well, so, uh, I, I'm saying it wrong, but in my mind, but what you said was it either you tap or you learn, or you tap. Yeah. Oh, so it, yeah, so you, you either win or you learn. Is you what either they win say. or you learn. That's yeah. what it was. And I mean, it's funny because I was uh, not that long it's ago. A, it's, I met it's, it's a switch. Yeah. <laughs> People <laughs> think losing means oh crap, you lost. Like yeah. from your dad, right? Like come on, man, you yeah. lost. 
But really what happened is you, either, you could think of it as either you won or you learn. And sometimes if you think of it as, man, learning is actually better. Yeah, and I think, right? and I think of it, I think, that's, there's, that's I, think the there's like, I think there's an added one, like kind of in the middle, you know? There's like, you win and you won. Oh, fantastic, you got the medal, you're excited, right? You can lose, right? It's not like you win or you learn. To me, it's like you win, you lost, yeah. or you learned, you know? So um, it's funny because I had this uh, meeting with Caesar Grace not that long ago. Uh, and I went to his academy, his beautiful academy, uh, um, out in uh, Concord area and uh, Pleasant Hill area. And we were talking, and uh, somebody came up, one of the guys, and he was like, oh, oh I went to this tournament. I didn't really win, but uh, I, I, either you win or you learn, right? He's like, no, there you you can lose. You <laughs> lost. You know, like, uh, like he's very old school, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's true, though, because it's like, I mean, he probably meant it a different way. But the way I look yeah, exactly. at it is uh, you exactly. win, and that's fantastic. That's beautiful. It's very exciting for everyone. Um, Losing to me is if you lost and you're just angry that you lost and you're not looking at why and how you lost, right? right? If you look at why and how you lost, the mistakes that you made, if you look back, you know what, I did this, I made. I should have hit the knee cut pass right here and I tried to step to the mount, that's what, that's what put me in this leg lock position. You're a winner right there I for lost. thinking that way. Yes, because it's, not about, it's, just not, about, it's not about just I lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lost, but now... How much am I going to gain from this? Or, or you're just a loser, like you lost, and you're just going to be bitter and stomp your feet and yeah. run away, mm -hmm. you know? Or you're going to try to take a moment, right? Because nobody likes to lose, so it sucks. You know, you walk around for a little, take a few minutes, and then think about, like, man, why did I lose? How, what position did I – I put myself in this position. I should have passed to the other side. I should have passed to the weak side. Why did I pass to the strong side? I knew my coach was telling me this was the guy's strong side, mm -hmm. his strong game. I shouldn't have put myself there. So I, I wasn't listening to, to my corner. Right? Or whatever, I started yeah. to do whatever, yeah. And try to take, basically try to accountability from that from You're that taking loss. accountability. Yes. That's the first step exactly. towards massive action, right? Towards yeah. change versus what is the ladder. And it's not about like, oh, he beat me right? because, oh, man, you're so strong. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how much you weigh? Like, why did that matter? Because you didn't ask them before you the match. Right. You didn't ask, hey, how much do you weigh before we start real fast? It was the, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, you don't do so, that. So no. just in case we lose, I'll, I'll have, yeah, a, I'll I have, have a reason to, to make myself feel that. better. You know, yeah, yeah. that's what happens. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and then it's the same thing happens in striking sometimes too. The guy asks you if you want to spar or something, you guys are sparring. Maybe, uh, maybe you're doing, you're doing uh, better with him than he expected. And then right. Oh, you know, I haven't, I haven't sparred in a while. It's been a few months, you know, but thanks for the round. I'll come back yeah. sharp. It's yeah. like, there's always like this little leeway to try to help us feel better about ourselves. You know what I mean? And the I think that, that's if, if they're saying that with their mouth, you can immediately know what the voice is going on in their head. Yeah, they're right? trying to say it in a calm way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, that, in that way, but uh, it's crazy because you can have two people that are exactly the same, but if one can, if we can change that, switch that, that mental mental switch for little things to actually think that way, think of, right, either you win or you learn, I think that makes a huge difference in an athlete, no matter who you are, no matter what sport uh, you're doing, and that's super important. Uh, so you, you loved it there. We trained with Winkle John, probably amazing experience. Amazing, did, yeah. Did, that, did a few... Uh, a few, few pro fights in New Mexico. Now they moved to that amazing, yeah, sick the new gym. facility. Yeah, but before you were walking out trying not to step on needles and stuff. I've seen that area it's, around there. It's rough, no, right? I, I didn't have any problems with that. New I didn't have any. No, no, no. Uh, and I'm I not know. trying to be disrespectful. I'm saying yeah. New Mexico is a tough town. I'm sure everybody oh, yeah. like at Winkle John will will be the first to tell you that. Yeah. So where, where that location was? Yeah, that location was in an area called the War Zone, and it was called that for a reason. Enough you said. know, like Enough when said. you is like I mean, and you're talking about one of the main coaches. His name is Chris Latrell. He has his own gym now. In Albuquerque, shout out to Coach Luttrell. Uh, he's a, he's an awesome individual, you know, and he's a uh, head of the gang unit for the police department out there, and uh, he's a, a monster too. He's like just a, just a great shape, older guy, but just a monster, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, he's the head of the gang unit. And a lot of their all their areas, and I used to do security and stuff there too for right some apartment buildings. Yeah, man, it's like a lot of you could be walking down the street, you look at somebody wrong, they shoot you. You know, yeah. everybody can carry guns there. It's open carry right. there, right. so. So that, um, made, that makes sense of why Jackson had to be like, okay, so it's invite only. Yeah, the, well, Cause, the doors cause were people, locked. People are probably walking in like, hey, yeah, one exactly, day. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I want to do my show. And people, it was people being nice enough, but a lot of times, um, like, you know, you got John Jones, you got Clay Guida, Donald Sorrell. Clay is here in Sacramento now. He's flying people down. Yeah, he wants Clay to is Sac Sacramento, but you have, like, at the time was Travis Brown, all these world-class names. So you would imagine people would walk in the door, oh, can I get a picture with you? And these guys are trying to train, you know? So they ended that they they added a key card on the door, so you mm. needed to have a key card. Solid, solid. Yeah, to get to get inside, so that way they, the fighters wouldn't get interrupted, you know. Um, but yeah, so Chris Latrell's out there; he's got his own gym now. Mike Winklejohn, I mean, 
Um, Greg Jackson is also very awesome. He was always very nice to me, um, but I just didn't get as much to spend as much time with him. He's a very busy guy. He was doing a lot of traveling and stuff at the time. Um, but Mike Winklejohn, man, he, I, I feel like he really took me under his wing, whether he felt that way or not. Uh, I feel like he really put time into me every day, took the time to pull me on side, said, hey, you need to start using this a little bit more. You need to do this more. Keep that distance a little better. Cut these angles a little bit more. That's why you're getting hit with this. And then he really helped develop my game to a level and allow me to survive in, in a tank full of sharks like that. And that's what, that's what a great coach does. I don't even, they probably don't even notice, uh, but it, when every person they touch, every person they come across, they literally make them feel like, you know, they took me under their wing. They're the first person that talked to, spoke to me yeah. in the right way, right? Where I learned and I wanted to learn and I wanted to come back to him yeah. for advice. You had a, a, a page come through, uh, Paige Van Zandt. Did she oh here, by? yeah, yeah, she came because we have a close relationship with like uh, some of the guys from Alpha Male, from SAC. Team Alpha Male, yeah, Alpha yeah. So because of my my head instructor now, who's Fabio Prado, he's uh, he was the main main jiu jitsu coach there for a long time. So he has he corners a lot of the fighters yep. and the UFC fights, all that stuff. I, I have a handful of friends who are uh, pros are here. If they're ever in the area, would you would you ask them to reach out? To oh, hundred percent. Yeah, out? feel free to stop in. Yeah, no charge. Okay. I'm just always uh, you know like me. Uh, my buddy David Mitchell, he's a monster too on the ground. He's got, a, he's had a long MMA career too, um, but he's a great grappler. Uh, I got some friends in Stockton. We got a lot of tough guys that like to come and train, and uh, there's no charge for me. It's all about, it's about learning, about making myself, uh, myself development better, and that way I can try to offer more to my students. You know, because the academy is so new. So right now I have time, like try to develop my skill as much as possible. The more I develop my own skill, the more I can pass on to everyone else, and then they can do the same thing to the next line. To the next generation. And, and any good athlete or someone who's going to be a good athlete in the future, um, that concept is no question, right? Yeah. The sport, they're always looking for new looks, always looking for new people uh, to, to evolve. Absolutely. Uh, so this is when we have these awesome talks. I didn't even look yet. Uh, I don't, we're not getting too crazy with time. Gabby, do you know where we're at? I don't. Who cares? Yeah, uh, I'm not. I will, I will just wrap, uh, wrap with the ones that I wanted to ask. So, um, See, I asked a few of these already. I know my last one. Oh, so I um, saw so recently one of the guys got a red belt. Hicks. Um, and for anybody who completely doesn't know, um, how far is that after black belt? So someone who's oblivious who's listening, yeah. quite a few stripes, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. How long is this so space to put between it in black perspective, and red? Yeah. To put it in perspective, I've been doing jiu-jitsu for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. Coming up on maybe 11. Um, about three decades, something like that. I will never reach red belt. Yep. Okay. I don't have enough time in my life unless you to go, reach red belt. Unless you live, you do it till you're 85 and you're still moving around. Even if, I'm, <laughs> even if I, I mean, mean, man, I would have to live until I'm like 90. Yeah. There's you obviously know, a story. Which I would love to, as long as I'm still healthy. healthy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it takes a long time. So to kind of break down the first steps, is like when you get your black belt, uh, the average is about seven, eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. Eight to ten years is where I like to vary. So like again, my black it's so hard to put time. I know that's what the controversy comes. Yeah. It's so hard to put timeline because it's more than that. It's contribution. It depends on who's promoting. And it's development. It's, it's self development. It's not just yeah. jujitsu development. It's your individuality. How right. how much you develop as a person, you know? And that's why it's so be, tough to watch other coaches who speed up. Yeah, you can't just be a good person here and then you go out and you're an asshole to everybody else. You can't do that. You know, it just doesn't that doesn't work that way. Jujitsu is about being a better person all around in life. Mm -hmm. Of course we all we all make mistakes here. Sometimes we say something we shouldn't have said, but it's about having the, the ability to come back and say, yeah, I mean, I shouldn't have acted that way. You know yep. I mean? Let me go, I'm going to go and apologize. Like, I should yep. have said that. You be the first I mean? to do that. Be yeah. accountable. Exactly. Be accountable go. and say, you know what? I'm sorry about that. You know, and, and hopefully you try to do better in the future, you know? But uh, yeah, so black belt usually takes about eight, 10 years. The, fir the first three stripes on your black belt are three years each. So to get your first stripe, you have to be a black belt for three years. To get your second stripe, that's six years. Third stripe, nine years. And then the, I believe it's the fourth, fifth, and sixth, I believe, are five years apiece. And then after that, I, I think it's eight years. You know, I, I mean, don't call me, but I think it's like eight years for every strike after six. And if anything speeds up that process, which nothing will completely speed up the process, it would be contribution in your personal gym. How you for stripes given, on the black belt, there is no you. ability. There's no, there's no way to speed the process, at least not in my vision. Right. And everywhere I know, like with my instructors and stuff like that, it's like, there's no way to speed it up. When you hit black belt, that's it. It's three years for every stripe, then it's five years, and that's it. There's no way to speed. I don't care so how that, many world that, championships That is the got. only point in which time is the attribute. Yeah, the after black. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. It's time put in, time teaching, right? Stuff like that. How much? Because it shows how much of jiu-jitsu you're spreading. Mm. And that's consistent time. It's not like you take two years off. 
come back for one year and you get your stripe. No, 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 that's where, yeah. You're talking about consistent yeah. time on the mat. You don't leave for five years and come back and expect, oh, I don't, I've been grappling for five years. Do you think maybe I can get my blue belt? No, you haven't been training with me for five years. I don't even know who, I don't even know yeah, who you are. Exactly. Like, you know, I'm not going to give you a blue belt because you've been training me for two months. You know? <laughs> it doesn't work that way, you know? Um, so, but with the color belts, there's that variance where this person's very good. They're very nice. They're developing very quickly. Okay, maybe he gets his, I mean, his blue belt in a year because he's, he's doing really good, you know? And, uh, and, or, you know, whatever. And then maybe he gets his purple belt in another year or a year and a half because he's very, very good. But when you hit that purple belt, now you're going to a different realm. You're hitting the next level. Right. Not only in competition, but of just a, 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 just with people in jiu-jitsu. You know, that purple belt is kind of like the milestone, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, for me it was a big milestone. I think for most people I think purple is the most important belt um, outside of the white belt, right? Like we say, the, the, the biggest, the biggest, most important belt by far, this sounds like cliche, oh, exactly. but oh, it is oh, the white I, belt. I think I know the, the, the answer. It's because most people actually usually... Yeah, give up or they don't give sure. Their... Yeah, but the answer for me is because it takes the most, the most like uh, uh, dedication and the right. most um, investment in yourself to just come into the academy or any jiu jitsu academy and, and enroll yourself. Like, you know, I want to learn jiu jitsu, I'm gonna stick with this. When you sign up and you sign up, boom, you get your new gi, you get your white belt, it's like I'm starting a new journey. Right. That's the first step to developing yourself to a better person, you know what I mean? At least that's the way I look at it. I know that when I did that. It definitely felt that way to me. I felt like I'm becoming something more now. I'm not just going to become some, 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 you know, some wannabe gangster or whatever, and just end up in jail in it's ten crazy. years. You know what I mean? Consistently dedicating yourself to any subject, especially in 2017, is something to be proud of, right? Because yeah. uh, I don't know what it is. Our multitasking mentality that it's much easier for us to just bounce give around. up, and bounce around, mm -hmm. spread ourselves thin, and yeah. and that's one thing. Sorry, I kind of learned. Uh, in life, I thought I was being productive by helping the family restaurants and doing real estate and doing technology. So you feel productive, but really you just have to ask four or five things. Yeah. When as opposed to choosing one thing and giving it one hundred percent, which is far more beneficial too, yeah. right? But but for some people's perspective, they think, well, I can do more. Well, stop. Try to do more of the other stuff. Whatever more you want to do, put it back to yeah. that. How much instead of digging five holes, dig yeah. one hole? How much? Super yeah. Deep. How much deeper could you get to that one? In that right. one hole, right? right. Exactly. And, exactly. And it's becoming uh, a rare. So I think for, for anybody to do that, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. Yes. Um, I answered so. Let me give you the weird, the weirdo Roman right. questions. Well, before I get to that, uh, for any women that are listening, to quite a few women. Um, I think, uh, and let me know if you agree or not. That obviously jujitsu is great for anyone who touches jujitsu, but more and more when you don't want to talk about off the mat self-defense, mm -hmm. uh, this is my opinion that I would give the edge um, that even, it's even more important for women. I want, I want to be careful and not say that it's more important for one person or the other. Anything, it's important for everyone. Uh, but, and reasons why women, you know, who might think, no, I don't want to get sweaty and roll, roll around. But no, in those life situations, knowing how to control someone, who's bigger than you, who's stronger yeah. than you, is the epitome of female self-defense because yeah. Male bone structure yeah, is just bigger. You're typically getting attacked by another man, by a man or something. You know? Right. Absolutely. And and to clarify that too, like we have a, we have a women's program here now too, which Gabby helps in, uh, teach uh, usually one or two days a week. Also, Gabby's Manny's wife. Yes, yeah, yeah. and she's a blue belt. She's been trained for about three or four years now. Um, but it's not always like oh, I'm just gonna be rolling around and getting all sweaty. No, you come in. We do some exercise to warm up. You know, so you get a little exercise there too. But then it becomes about technique and and explanation of those positions and why they're so important why we need to grab the wrist why we need to hold the head down and why those positions are going to keep us safe from this keep us safe from that and helping not only the women but everyone in jiu-jitsu understand what those positions are about because it's not just about get to this position and do this you know it's and, like no you, you want really to talk about how science it can benefit you. there there's a science that you wouldn't imagine if, if those of you who, who you know haven't ever explored the subject and i think that's one of the goals is to again spread that knowledge and give value uh, so it, it, even more so, if you consider yourself a very intelligent w woman, I think it's just even more for you, right? Because if you understand, you can comprehend like a sponge technique and, yeah. and give that commitment, you can be great. So it has nothing to do with how athletic you are. And really. one of the reasons that I fell in love with things like wrestling is for you women that are listening or even thinking about it, uh, it technique over muscle without a doubt, right? So, yeah. uh, but the step, the biggest step is being open-minded and showing up, right? That's yeah, probably absolutely. The, 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 and, the hardest part. Yeah, there's other I'm, women like Benny said to train with you. Just, and I'll tell you describe. right now, every time we've had, because that's normal, right? The women are kind of nervous, and I mean, even the men when they could, they're kind of nervous. Like I don't know, you know. 
Or then we they feel try. We don't know, right? Yeah, exactly. Educated. Exactly. So, but a lot of times, uh, um, when you're new to jujitsu, man, it doesn't matter. You end up really surprising yourself at how intricate jujitsu is and how how much the little details play such a humongous part in your ability to be efficient in defending yourself or even being able to finish a fight if need be. A lot of times, especially the women, because uh, you know the physical the physical aspect. Sometimes, like if I put a guy who's two hundred pounds and a woman who's under 130 pounds, it's kind of like there's a big physical difference there. But if the woman that's 130 pounds uh, is efficient in fighting for off her back, on, on top, all these different positions, and she understands the and efficient positions. with her energy too. She's yes, exactly. Tired. She understands so how to be, and that's what I mean by efficient. Right? She understands how to be. How to stay calm, calm keep yes, the breathing yes, yes, yes. and have confidence in her techniques and her, her positions. Um, and she, there, I have no doubt that, uh, uh, I mean, some of the women we have here have only been training six months. And they're a handful for the guys to roll. You know, and they're, it's like, it's amazing what you can accomplish regardless of your size or physical ability or inability. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, there's there's people, I have a friend, Tyler, in Sacramento, uh, you know, from the waist down, he has no use of his legs. But he competes and wins at these tournaments, you know? And he's just super, and he's going with guys just like very uh, athletic guys, and he's like always finds a way to win because he's very efficient. Mm -hmm. and he's been training jiu-jitsu now, I don't even know, but he's a brown belt now, so probably like six, seven, eight years, nine years, you know. Real quick, man, gi versus uh, no gi. I know for people who are training for real life situations, yeah. you know, I've heard you this say, is a good conversation. I, I heard you say no, that's good, they're awesome. <laughs> no, uh, no, it takes two. Uh, I've heard you say no gi, you know, Roman, you should try no gi once in a while, mm -hmm. but. Then again, uh, one of the quickest ways he choked me on seconds was uh, from, from my caller. And the reason I'm thinking about this is I'm thinking back to a commercial where, yes, I'm thinking back to a commercial uh, on female self-defense where this guy is being kind of aggressive at the, uh, the bar and she comes over like she's continuing to flirt, whispers in his ear, but then grabs like his caller, both yeah. of them, uh, holds him the That's entire it. time, and he, and, and he passes out drunk on the bar and she walks out. You know, yeah. peacefully. Yeah. And I don't even know where the hell that came from, yeah. uh, where I even heard that. But that made me think of, of Gi. But for those who don't know, I can think that's one aspect of where having that knowledge might be important. Yeah, people is, ask this question a lot. Th th yeah. People ask this question a lot, right? And to me, I tell people all the time, and the ladies ask me this question a lot, the guys ask me this question a lot, I tell people all the time, if you want to be good at self-defense, mm -hmm. train in the Gi. Train in the Gi. Because any time you get into a confrontation, very rarely... Is the person butt naked with no clothes on? You know what I mean. That's there's true. usually That's something going on. Yes, you know, yes, there's yes. some shorts, a t-shirt. You know, and a lot of times uh, people more don't tools. have experience. More yes, tools, yeah. and people don't, maybe don't have experience. It's, it's hard for them to comprehend, which is understandable. There's no re need to even put those people down. They haven't experienced it, so there's no reason for them to believe it. But when you're training the gi, you understand not all this fancy stuff. Like you see, like in competition, people grab the gi and they wrap it seven times around the guy's arm or some crazy stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about understanding how to grab and use grips on a shirt or a sleeve and pants to how to control the person, how to take them down. Because if you can understand how to control by grabbing shorts and a t-shirt, you can make it nearly impossible for that person to get back up to their feet. You know, So that plays a big factor. Even if it's a tank top with like two little straps like that and you understand how to use it, you can, with a button up like this, any type of shirt you can use to choke someone if you need it to, right? Um, I don't know if you watched it, but what was so frustrating for me was uh, Damien versus Tyron Woodley. Yes. I, I mean, it was, I mean, hats off to, to Tyron, respect, but I was thinking in my mind that uh, I think he had a record for how many times he tried to take Tyron down, which is so frustrating yeah. to watch. But imagine if both of them started fighting these on. Oh, yeah. What you, exact, and that's a perfect example. Segue was. Yeah, there's no way. I mean, even, even, if, even, if, even if Tyron had a pair of jeans on. Yes. If Tyron had a pair of jeans on, that's fine. He would have got strangled inside of two game. rounds. Yeah. Which, if you want to say, let's be realistic, let's fight for reals outside Tyrone, of here, they'd have both that clothes on. And, and kudos to Tyron. He had a game plan. People were giving him a hard time. Yeah. But he, Tyron Woodley had a game plan. I'm like, the fuck you're, talking about, you're talking about a guy who's like a nine, ten time world champion who's been strangling everyone he fought it's up hard, until you. It's hard to put in perspective. Yeah. The and average UFC fighter versus Damian. Yeah. Martin. And you're talking about uh, uh, Tyron Woodley is. One of the best wrestlers in MMA right now. State, the yeah. high, yeah, the, the highest level of accolades in wrestling. So that's so, respect. That's yeah, that and is. you're talking about these are the these are two highly trained martial artists. And what is that? This uh, is not uh, like uh, a, street, a, a fight dance, in the street, boom, whatever, right? Yeah. So to me, it was, the game, right? it was like holy shit. One takedown is all it takes. No, forget about one taken. I've seen Damien get on the side of a guy standing up, jump off the cage, and take his back. Yeah. Right. So I was there for that, but obviously 
as it went on, the sweatier time it gets, the sure. harder it's going to be, which is where I was going in with uh, with Guy. But uh, this is why I love this man. If you guys weren't here, it, three hours would go by and we'd freaking be talking. Yeah, sorry. Oh, snap. It's like a brother-in-law's uh, party starts at one. <laughs> aren't you supposed to be in Sacramento? I'm supposed to be in Sacramento. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, on my way. Sorry, brother-in-law. It's my I'm fault. leaving. Oh, look my at that. Fault. My wife just joined by check on what the hell is taking him so long. It's, sorry. Uh, I'm coming home. It's, I'm it's one. But amazing, amazing conversation. Last thing I'll say, I want to throw a twist to you. Um, God, there's so many more I wanted to ask you, but that's okay. We'll to them for. We'll have you on again, man. Okay. Um, what is uh, what, what does greatness mean to you? Because mm -hmm. I think the motto of Strive, and I was going to ask you this before I even came across the Strive motto is Strive for greatness, right? Uh, and that's a really tough question. And I'm, you're going to look back and watch this and say, "Well, I could have said this. I wish I would have said this." But if you had to sum it up to a five-year-old or something like, what does it mean to to, to to strive think, for greatness to I you. think uh, if I t if I think about my own life and how I've like yeah, put it toward my life, greatness to me is having the guts and the confidence in yourself to do whatever it is makes you happy. That's greatness to me. If yeah. something's gonna make you happy, and and you're like, man, if I if I could find a way to do this. For the rest of my life, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if it makes you uncomfortable, because it's gonna be uncomfortable. Are you kidding me? When I first, when we left San Jose, I didn't have a job, I didn't have anything. I told Gabby, I'm gonna train people in the garage. Coach Sam gave me mats, mm -hmm. right? I just mat in my garage. I was like, I'm gonna train people here, you know, and that's just how it goes. Gabby didn't have anything too. She started from scratch, right? We had some money that I had saved up, right? That was it to pay the first couple months of rent. And boom, we're gonna hit the ground running, and we had no choice at that point. And those voices, so it's those voices to you are gonna be be like, "Come on, man, you gotta be realistic." Well, I say, "Fuck, yeah. fuck realistic." We'll, yeah. we'll figure it out on the realistic, way. Realistic, real. Like, think about that word. Realistic yeah. is whatever you make your reality. Yeah, there's no whatever yeah, you can yeah. whatever you can make into a reality is mm -hmm. realistic for you. If it's not realistic for other people, that's them. I, you know? Einstein would agree with that for sure. Yeah, you know, it's like. It, it, I, we're all different. We all have different perspectives. We all want different things out of life, I think. But for me, it's just about having the guts and to go after what's truly going to make you happy. And some people are not going to agree with you or they're going to say like, oh, I don't know, I think it's a good idea. That's fine. It's not for them, right? You hear that a lot. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for you. You get this one life. You get this one life to do whatever you can do to make yourself achieve the highest level of happiness possible because you are going to die. I'm going to die. Rome's going to die. My wife's going to die. We all are. We're all going to be gone one day. So for us to not jump as far as we can, as high as we can, anything you can do to reach the highest level of happiness that you can achieve is the of the utmost importance because the time will pass so quickly. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Right. This is kind of, yes, this is kind of a bummer, right? But we went to this Joe Rogan show and we went to go walk into the show. And as we're walking into the show. He walked by you, didn't he? No. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Okay. This, is, this is a sad thing. Okay, this is a sad thing. But as we're walking into the show, to put things in perspective, we're going to somewhere positive. We want to go laugh. We want to go have a good time. In the lobby, an older man fell over dead from his wheelchair. Now, you think about, like, we're going to do something positive. Like, oh, we're excited. Joe Rogan. And this guy, this older man, unfortunately, like, passed away right there. Like, right in front of us. We were watching him. You know, like wow. when, when we got too? there, they were trying to do CPR. He was already done. You know, yeah. I walked over because they said they need to turn to the side. So I go up and I was about to try to help him turn on the side, but he was already, uh, he was already done. That's traumatic experience, yeah. You know, but it's not even about the traumatic experience. My point is, yeah, my point is, I couldn't even focus that much on the show anymore right. because I'm thinking about like it's things like that that sometimes are a reminder, unfortunately, that our time here is limited. Yeah. You know, it could be any more. You hear it's so cliche, and people are like, oh yeah, you hear it all the time. Blah, blah, let me just go on about whatever. Yeah, I get it. But until you see something like that. Until you see something like that or until something happens to you mm -hmm. where, you almost, where you almost lose your own life, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it, you start to understand that this is important. I really need to get on what's going to make me happy because if you just keep spending your life miserable and just doing shit that everybody else wants you to do to try to make them happy, when you die, if those people are still around, it's not it's not going to be what you did to make their life all, all make them feel better about themselves, whatever, you know what I mean? You kind of get what I'm saying, right? Absolutely. It's about like it's about what you can do to live the highest level of happiness in your own life with the time that you have. Because yeah. if you don't do that, people like to say, oh, I live for these people, and I do all this for these people. There's, there's, yeah, but there's then no that person better motivator on earth. And it sounds like, okay, this is heavy. Let me, let me stop. No, I'm sorry. So, okay. so I like so, it some, that. Some, sometimes the, sometimes the, 
the person, people like to say like, oh, I do this for these people and I don't think about myself. Mm -hmm. I'm selfless. And to be honest with you, I think that's bullshit, you know, because I always tell people this all the time. It's not because I don't enjoy helping other people. Mm -hmm. I love helping. If I can bring a smile to someone else, help make their life better. That's the biggest pleasure in the world. But there's no doubt, there's no question that if you are not at the highest level of happiness within yourself, or at least trying to achieve that happiness, or do the best you can for yourself, how are you going to help everyone else? Start you can't help everyone else if you're unhappy. You're if you're miserable and you can't and you haven't achieved the things that make you happy in your life, how are you going to help anyone? You're yeah. going to tell someone you should do this, and they're going to be like, "Why the hell are you not doing it?" Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It starts with the self. It yeah. starts with you. Take yeah. a chance. Do what makes you happy. You know. Yeah. Of course, we all have these different things that hold us back. Yes, blah blah. blah. We can go on for that for a million years, and no, people no, say like, "Whatever." What, what, but, what you just said was Rusi's exact words. Rusi's exact words that he got from Sun Tzu. The art of war back in times and it was the exact same thing know thyself like when you know that yourself first then you can uh, help others yeah until that you can't really begin right yeah you have you uh, have to create your own happiness first you have right. to develop yourself and be happy with yourself first when you are truly happy with yourself is the only time you can bring happiness to other people when you're not happy with yourself you're just bullshitting Right. To try to make everybody else think that you're happy, so that way you can try to make them buy your fake happiness. Right. But it doesn't work that Especially way. If you're people. genuinely happy, people will know you're genuinely happy, and they'll want to be around you. Right. You right. know what I mean? Ended at that. That was fucking beautiful. But and no, I, but figure I it out first. Talk a lot of shit no, no, no. <laughs> that, that was that was epic. And, and if I didn't agree with you, I would say, Manny, I don't agree agree with you. But, but that's epic because it starts with the self. And I'll, I'll send you something on that too. But people. Sorry for taking so long. We hope that brought value to somebody. This is why I wanted you guys to meet uh, Manny. And if you're ever in the area, um, I highly recommend you guys stop by his gym. I'll send more pictures. Lots of love. Fabian. Fabian's joined. Thank you for that. <laughs> Fabian contributed a lot and helped out with this gym. Right, Manny? Great guy. Yes, yeah. um, and I uh, just want to say Fabian's thank you. Brother. I'm uh, super late. My brother-in-law is... I'm going to upload this on to YouTube. And then I will throw the Instagram uh, on there. But just real quick, Gabby, website is... Little Strivers Family Daycare. One more time? That's Little Strivers. Little Strivers Family Daycare for daycare. And uh, I'll, I'll throw all this in there in the description. But much love, guys. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you. Um, thank you for watching. Cheers.